All right, so we're going to talk about like the four steps of print, and you guys kind of have an idea of it, and you've already created devices, so you've done basically the steps of two, three, and four. Um, but you haven't done the first step, which was the design or creation. And yep. that's what we like to advertise the most, is that you should design and make your models. Um, that's just because it's a huge learning experience. The CAD design software that you utilize is applicable later on in life. You can actually use it at different institutions and different stuff like that. So, you know, colleges like people that have that, you will get into better programs. And then also, you know, there's jobs out there that pay simply for CAD model. Um, and those are both things that we want you to experience and use. So we have a couple recommendations. So in that term, we have Tinkercad is our very beginning recommendation. Um, it's super simple, super easy. It's made by Autodesk. And what you do is you basically drag and drop shapes onto a work plane. And by combining those shapes together, you get an object. Okay. So that's Tinkercad.com. That's as easy as it is. And then the other one that I would recommend, since you guys are like a junior in college and you're kind of working towards all of that stuff, I would recommend you use Fusion 360. Um, it's a much more robust program, and it's a traditional CAD program. So what I mean by that is if you were to take something like this size, you know, this is just a simple rectangle. If I were to sketch this type of rectangle on an axis or a plane, right, so say this big black area here is a plane or a flat surface, and I draw that rectangle, and then I can use something called extrude, which is going to pull this rectangle out of the surface. And so it would basically make it like so, and then I would have a full rectangular prism in that shape. Okay. And that's going to be your basic CAD design. So you can make all sorts of different objects. So, so you say um, this Tinkercad is more of a user-friendly version compared to Fusion? So Tinkercad, yes. So Fusion 360 can be overwhelming at the start, and you are going to have to kind of probably look up some YouTube tutorials and kind of go over that kind of stuff. Um, Tinkercad, you can more of just start immediately because all you're doing is pulling shapes in, and then once you get more familiar with the environment, you'll, it'll be easier to port over to something like Fusion 360 because the camera controls are going to be very similar the movement's going to be very similar, and it should be a little bit easier. Um, that's kind of why we recommend it at the very start. But you'll find that what, if you were to log on to it, you'd feel like it is simple, and you feel like you probably could use it in quite a few different ways. So, mm -hmm. um, so and also, kind of my experience in these CAD software programs, sometimes a mouse is necessary because you need that uh, basically scrolling ball in the middle. Um, yes. So I be the case for these. I don't CAD design or I don't, I don't model anything without a mouse. It's, okay. it's way too difficult. Yeah. Um, it actually makes me frustrated when I try to, cause I'm so used to using a mouse. Whenever I like only have a touchpad or something, I freak out and I'm like, I'll do this later when I have a mouse. So yeah, that's what I would recommend. Definitely use a mouse for it. So that's going to be your first two. And of course, out of that process, you know that we're going to get one type of file. And that's that STL file that you guys have been downloading and utilizing, right? Yeah. So whenever you use it in one of those programs like Tinkercad, there's an export button. You would click on that and it says STL or OBJ. Any of those would work. And then you can put it in a cure like you were doing previously. So the export's really easy on that. On Fusion 360, it's a little bit more difficult, but there's just another option for you to select that basically has the image of a 3D printer. You click on it, and you can export the file as an STL. Okay. Um, so that's pretty much it. Those are pretty easy to get out of it, and then Cura is kind of the next step that we want to go towards, and I'm sure you guys do have a lot of questions because you probably had a little bit of experience with it, but I, there's a lot of things that you can... Yeah, like an hour's worth of experience. Now, um, on these CAD software programs, are there some that you would suggest to stay away from just because they don't uh, mesh well with Kira? No. Um, so most of the programs, they mesh perfectly fine with it. Well, I guess SketchUp in its own forms sometimes doesn't work right simply because a lot of the models that you create in SketchUp don't have closed edges or vertices. And if you don't have a closed edge or vertice, then it's going to create a problem when you try and export it as an STL and print it. So okay. it's going to be a little bit difficult. Um, I've just encountered that a couple times. Usually you can use it, but that's just a little bit of advice from myself and self-experience. Uh, all other programs, when you export to an STL, it covers most of your bases. And then, of course, you view it in Cura and see everything that you need to change if you do. So, so is oh. this the handle, the big yellow thing on top? Yeah, the big yellow thing on top, the handle here. 
Okay, just making sure that's like the... Yeah, all right, so now we should be good. So you know that you're gonna design or make something. And so I recommend doing like maybe practical things first and it makes it a little bit easier. No, you know, if you need like a wall hook, that's something cool to design. Um, then you can test the strength of the wall hook and kind of how it uses. And then from there, you can step more and more into different objects and utilizing those, whether in your classroom or the community at large. So, mm -hmm. all right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna share my screen and we're gonna to touch base over all those settings in Cura that you have seen earlier. So it sounds like you do have your printer set up successfully, but I am going to go through every little bit of it just so that you know that all of the settings that you have should be correct. And if you need to change them, you can. Yeah. All right. So this is the main Kira screen. And is this the same screen that you guys are at? Um, I mean, let me go ahead and open that up. I know it's installed, so it should be a little bit easier. The ladies did a great job at the library last time we went over this. So, so um, I'm, your audio is not, can't really hear you. So the audio changed a little bit. Uh, about, let me scroll. It's very low. Not now. Better, yes. Better? Awesome. Good. Nine and day. Sweet. Let's get in here. Okay, so let me share my screen again. And do you have this opening cure now? Mm -hmm. Sweet. So what we're going to take a look at first is we're going to go to the machine to check our machine settings, make sure that everything's correct in that option before we move on to kind of this side panel that has our print settings. Okay. So yeah. like here in the top toolbar, we click on machine and then go down to machine settings. Okay, machine, machine settings. Mm -hmm. And then it should pull up a little dialog box, and these are going to be your settings for the smaller A5. And then we can also touch base on the A31 settings, so they're super easy. So um, I think the ladies at the library only had an A31, is that correct? Uh, we, we have both. We have the small one. Which, okay. Um, I forgot the name of the model. Uh, A5. Yeah, and then we also have the larger one. So we have okay. both. Okay, so what setting does it say that the machine is? So what's the name of the machine in that case? Let me go to that real quick. Certainly. So if you, if you need to minimize myself or my screen, you hit escape in it. Um, no, I just have two um, tabs going on. Now, under the machine settings that you mentioned, uh -huh. um, be two tabs on top, NWA3DA5 and an A31. Perfect. Okay, that's both of the uh, models that you actually have. So let's double check the settings for the A5 first, and then we'll double check the settings for the A31. Cool? Okay, so just to clarify, which one's the A5, the bigger one? So the A5 is the yellow handle. Okay, ah, gotcha. The smaller number, the smaller printer. Cool? Got you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yellow. All right, so on the maximum width for the A5, it's going to be 125 or right around 5 inches. Mm-hmm. Maximum depth is going to be 150, and then the maximum height will be 100 millimeters. Okay. And so most of these programs are utilized in millimeters just because that's what everyone else in the world uses. Yeah. Um, so this is basically the maximum volume that it has to, to print with, right? Perfect, yes. So it is its binder box or the area that it can actually print within. Okay. This is kind of shaped a little bit smaller just to make sure of it because 125, because if you convert millimeters to inches, one inch is 5.4 millimeters. So in realities, it's a little bit smaller than advertised just to make sure that it doesn't go out of its bounds and messed up the printer. Okay. Okay. So all those settings should be like so. And then you want to make sure that this heated bed is not clicked on the A5. Heated bed, yeah. It should There's be no Sweet. So let's check the A31 just by scrolling over to the next tab real quick. And then we can check, check the same things here. And it's going to be the width, depth, and height. So the width is going to be 300 millimeters on the A31, 300 on the depth, and 400 on the height. Mm -hmm. okay. And then it does have a heated bed. So you want to make sure that's checked. Yeah. Sweet. And that's all of the different settings between the two. Other than changing the bed heating in the print settings. 
So that's the only differences that you really have between the A31 and A5. Now, now typically when we open Cura, those mm -hmm. will be default, right? Yes, so one of those will pop up. So if you wanna change machines, if I close out of the settings, if we click on the machine option, you should see the two machines available to you. Mm -hmm. And then you can swap between the two. So if you were to click on the A31, you'd see a big blue box. If you click on the A5, it'll be a smaller box. Okay. And even if you slice the settings for the smaller printer and you send it to the larger printer, it's not gonna harm it in any way. It's still gonna print it off successfully. But if you use the larger printer and send it to the smaller one, it's probably gonna mess up. Yeah. Cool. All right, so now we can kind of talk about each of these settings. And do you have any prior questions before I kind of just ramble through them? Um, no, I was just gonna ask what would happen if it's given a larger geometry on the A5? So if it's given a larger geometry, the motors will try and assume to go off in that area, and then it will basically just make noises at you. So it'll start kind of clicking or ticking at you because the motors can't go that far. Mm -hmm. Because they'll hit the end block of the x-axis or y-axis. Yeah. And then that's it. And then it's just going to try and squirt out plastic everywhere. Okay. Yeah. So it shouldn't be, too, shouldn't be too bad. You'll probably just hear it, and then you just unplug it or otherwise. So, well, one of the things I, um, I, I had a question is, so for example, we went, we used the user manual and it was very helpful, but the user manual didn't really get into um, in depth as to what certain options were that, I mean, just basically said, make sure this is that, and then go ahead and print. Is there anything on your end that you would suggest that, oh, you should take a look at this. It'll help you in the future kind of thing. Yes, so that's what I'm about to actually cover. So I'm gonna step through each of these settings. I'll explain the settings to you, and also what values that you can typically range from. Does that work for you? Mm -hmm. So here on layer height, we, have a, we use a value of anywhere from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. One is gonna be the highest quality print that these can really pull off, and then 0 0.3 is gonna be a low or a coarse quality print. Okay. And then you can put it anywhere else in between those two. Usually we just round by whole numbers or integers, so it's just 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 .2. Um, You can put 0 0.15 and so on and so forth. That is available. So this is actually the height at which the, uh, uh, it's deposited, basically the resin, the filament. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what this is. So, you know, it's going to step up only 0 0.1 millimeters the next time. So the closer they are together, the smoother it's going to look, the further they are apart the more coarse it's gonna look, right? And also longer time if it's more yes. quality. Right, so if you're trying to print more volume continuously, it will increase your time and it will also increase the amount of material used. Wait, so next is gonna be the shell thickness. The shell thickness is going to determine the outside parameter or the width of the wall. So it only determines the wall of the model. So if you have anything that's going in the vertical direction, this is gonna decide how thick it is. So you can change this value anywhere from multiples of four. So you could put this at 0 0.4, which is the smallest you can do, 0 0.8, 1.2, 1.6, and so on. Due to the fact that your nozzle size is 0.4 millimeters, so the only amount it can actually put down at one time is 0.4. Mm -hmm. This shell thickness would cause two passes of the nozzle before it moves on. Make sense? Yeah, what would you suggest on that? So I almost exclusively print on 0 0.8 millimeters just because it's a decent shell thickness and then by using the fill density, I get the durability of the object. Okay. Trying to make something that needs to have support from its walls itself, whether it be a model or something that will go under stress deformation, then could increase that value to make it to where the walls are better. So you could increase it to 1.2 or 1.6 and then it'll be a much thicker wall. We can mm -hmm. observe that here in a second whenever we load in a model. Now, I'll show you what changing the shell thickness will actually do to the inside of it. Okay. So, retraction here is going to be the amount that the filament is pulled back whenever it's moving from spot to spot. So, the 3D printer actually has uh, a tool path that it follows. And whenever it's moving from maybe one object to another object or from one space to another space and it's not printing, it uses a retraction command that causes the filament to be pulled back by uh, gear, the feeding gear, and then it makes it to where it doesn't string all over your model. So this setting essentially just makes your model look a little bit cleaner. Okay. That's pretty much all it really does. 
Um, yeah. It's pretty valuable in that sense, and I recommend it always being on. Now, is this something that is basically utilized whenever you have like multiple objects being printed? So yes, and it can also be utilized whenever you are printing one model. So sometimes the printer will pick up one spot and go to another spot. So say it started here at this corner, but it wants to go to this corner over here and it doesn't want to print the whole time, then it'll follow a path and it'll move over there. Once it gets to that point, then it'll redo the retraction and it'll push out filament again. Okay. So and it's- Click it. Yeah. And you shouldn't have to change any of those settings. If you use a different type of printer, sometimes you do. Uh, they should be perfect for the A5 and the A31 right now. All right, so next we have the bottom and top thickness, and this is the exact same idea as the shell thickness just for the bottom and top of a model. Now, the 3D printer treats it differently because if you ever look at the bottom and top of the models, they are printed differently than walls two passes and then the bottom layer, you're going to outline it a whole bunch until you fill in that surface area and then you can move up and fill it in. And so, on and so, forth. And so this is gonna determine that that entire area will be 0.8 millimeters thick. Okay. And that's all it determines, right? So it's just going to be determinant of how much material is deposited on the bottom or top. Next, we're gonna have our fill density and this basically decides the durability of your object. Um, it's easier to express whenever we look at the model and kind of view over it. Essentially, it increases the amount of material that connects sides, bottoms, and tops. And you can see that here in a little bit. It's, and wants to see it. Next, the print speed. Now, our print speed on these printers, typically 50 millimeters per second is the highest value you want, want to go without sacrificing quality. If you do 60 millimeters per second, you're going to sacrifice how your model looks or how well it is designed, and it could build area. So if it has a small surface area to start with, it's possible for it to knock it off just by the movement. Mm -hmm. So 50 millimeters per second is the recommended. If you decrease this value to 25, 35, anywhere in that range, increase the quality of your model and it'll also increase the look of overhangs so basically areas that don't touch the build surface mm -hmm. increase their um, shape you know how they're printed well what do you find a, a, as an ideal value whenever from your experience um so it kind of depends on what my model is and what i'm going to print it off as so if it does have overhangs and if i am utilizing a lot of support material i do like to turn it down towards 35 millimeters per second I'm doing like a finishing draft or a finishing quality. So I'll probably use 0 0.1 layer height and then I would do maybe a 35 millisecond uh, print speed and then it would turn out really nice from that. And that's kind of the idea whenever you want to do a finished draft or a finished model. Mm -hmm. That's just my personal preference, yeah. So next is gonna be printing temperature and we recommend 220 degrees Celsius. That's just because the type of filament that we, if you order it from us, we have different types that we use, push plastic and toner plastic. They both use the same source material plastic and it's a little bit extra flexible, so it requires more heat to melt. Um, now, what we have in front of us is, uh, it has the acronym PLA, and I know yes. there's a second one. Is there, what's the difference between those two? So PLA is polylactic acid and it's actually a biodegradable cornstarch that produces no harmful fumes. Now there's many, many different types of current filaments that you can put in your fuse deposition modeling machines, but in this case, the most obvious ones are PLA and ABS. Okay. This is the other second type that is used most often, but it does produce nasty smelling fumes. They're not necessarily toxic, they just smell really, really bad. Mm -hmm. Also recommended that you print that within an encapsulated object. Now, um, are there any advantages to one or the other? Or? So yes, ABS is actually much more durable and strong, and it's slightly more uh, basically flexible than PLA is. PLA is very brittle, and it's so it is going to be easier to break, and it's not going to have as much ending strength. Um, so what I would recommend is there's multiple different values that you could use, but I would also recommend you could use something called PET G or PETG. It's another type of plastic and it is actually combines the values of PLA and ABS while it produces no fumes and it prints really well on these printers. So that's another thing to consider. Um, so it is a combination of that hardness and strength that the ABS provides, but the easiness of printing with PLA. Okay. Um, is it more expensive? 
it, I think it is a tad more expensive. You'll have to check on it. Okay. Source it from. Yeah. Um, PLA is going to be the easiest type of plastic to print with because for one, it doesn't warp. ABS warps heavily and does require a heated bed and also probably a heated chamber to successfully lay flat. So, there's a whole bunch of differences on the type of filament you can use and I would definitely recommend if you guys are looking after you kind of get used to PLA, I would recommend you look at other you know, types of plastic and different things. So like if you're trying to bring drone parts, there are carbon fiber uh, composite filaments that you could actually use. Um, and those are very strong, but they can break after a large impact. So mm -hmm. There are some things that you can consider later on once you're more familiar with 3D printing. So, any other questions about filament and kind of printing temperature? Um, yeah, it just seems like you sacrifice um, the smell for the quality, basically, but just how you mentioned um, PLA is... ABS is very hard to print with. If you do decide to print with it, you'll notice it warps very often. It'll be really hard to make it flat. And then you probably want to put it in a, at least a ventilated area. So it doesn't yeah. but that's about it. Yeah. Awesome. So next we're going to have support types and supports help with overhangs or objects that aren't laying on the build plate. So if you are printing a complex object and it has something that maybe you're printing a robot and it has an arm hanging above the build area. Is its arm and it has nothing below it. Created underneath this in order to help print this model whenever it gets there, and that's all support is going to do. Um, if you do look at support, there are multiple different options you can select. You can actually, if you click on the ellipsis here on the side next to support, you can choose what degree of angle you want to print the support at, the fill amount or percentage. So, how strong is that support material? So, the less material, the easier it is to remove. The more material, the more support, and harder it is to remove from the model. And then you can have your X, Y distance, which I probably wouldn't change, but the Z distance is the distance between the bottom of that model or bottom of the arm. <laughs> so that distance between those two values either makes the separation easier or harder. Increase the value, it's going to the model look worse, right? But this area will look worse look better, but it'll be extremely hard to remove it effectively. Fine line between deciding, do I want it to look nice or do I want it to support it well? Or do I want it to come off easy? So that's a, a value you can tinker with and you can also figure out in a couple different ways. Um, and One that I would recommend tinkering with as I have done a lot and I found certain values help it out a little bit. Now on this um, support, is it almost a default if there are any overhangs, how you mentioned? Um, can it just be introduced or is, there, is this something that you have to plan ahead and put into your STL file? So this is not something you need to plan ahead. This is not something you need to do prior. This is generated by Cura itself and will produce supports for the model you print. So your design can be your regular design, whether it be like a house and see that house has overhanging little arches that come off of the walls, support will be generated by Cura to support those overhangs off the walls, right? And mm -hmm. that's going to be all Cura itself, and you don't have to adjust for that. Okay? So we recommend everywhere at the very start, just in case you do print any model that has a overhang or area that isn't supported by the build area. Um, if you want to, you can select none. Um, if you're printing like a model, if you're printing like a cube or something like that, or if you're printing a model that only goes up in this area and doesn't have any overhangs, you can select none. It's going to decrease your time. And most likely, it'll make the look of the printer a little bit better. Touching build plate is only true for things that are directly above the build area. It basically says like if you have a model or a, do you know what a four-dimensional cube looks like? No. Maybe not. Okay. That's fine. So, I'll load one. So, this is an STL file I did get from Thingiverse, so it is not mine, so I don't want to take credit for it or anything. But this is the idea of a four-dimensional cube. Okay. In this fact, if we were to put it as support type as touching the build plate, areas that are actually directly underneath the build plate would actually be supported. So anything right here would be supported. But this area, this arch here would not be. So you can actually view that. If I go to view mode, layers, 
and it'll actually generate the view that the printer sees. It just show me all of the materials that will actually print off and the colors that it corresponds to. And so this is the view that I use most often. I almost never look at it in that yellow view of the model. I look at it in this view to view what's going on. So if you notice that only these areas are supported by material because touching the build plate is assigned. Now if I select everywhere, you'll notice that the blue becomes almost all over this model because it's trying to fill in every area that needs support that's overhanging the model. And it takes a little minute and it'll generate here in a second. Um, question on the, uh, where was that view option? So here in the top right hand corner, you'll have view mode and you can select it and go down to layers. This is probably the most critical view and this is something that you will probably find very, very useful from here on out if you didn't know about it. So view mode and then select layers and then you can actually scroll through the layers that it's going to print off. So if I can zoom in here, you can actually view every single piece of this object and how the printer is going to move. And so, um, what does the blue represent? So this light blue represents the support material that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Blue represents the tool path of the printer and how it moves. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the red is the outside shell thickness. Green is the interior shell thickness. And then the O is going to be your support material. And also designate as your bottom and top material. Okay. So if you're looking at the bottom or top. So that light blue um, that we're looking at will be basically taken off. Right, that's yes. just supporting the object, okay. Exactly, it's just supporting the object and notice that it is printed thinly and it's printed sparse, you know, it's not like fully filled out or anything and doesn't have the same kind of idea that this does. Yeah. We're gonna break it off later is the idea. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So layer view is pretty much the view I use most often. And like I said, the red is going to be your outside shell and so on. Need a refresher on that. Oh no! Yeah, this doesn't have a little uh, key for you. I think I just learned that over time. So, all right. So that's going to be your layer view. Now we can check out the platform adhesion type. And so I'm going to go ahead and remove my support so it's a little bit easier to see. So platform adhesion is going to help secure this to the build plate. So if I were to come over here and select brim, which is the only recommendation we, use. a raft is typically too much plastic and too much time addition. You don't. Recommend. So brim is going to create, notice that the blue area underneath it, there's a extra kind of support area that's moved out from it now. Mm -hmm. And that's to keep more surface area so that the object doesn't tip over or something. Okay. So we like to use platform adhesion. So say if you're printing something with a small surface area or something like a pin, a small pin, you would print it standing up to get the best quality, but it's actually itself over, so you would want to create a platform adhesion type for it. All right, so next the diameter is 1.75. That's just for the type of diameter you're, or type of filament that you're using. That is the type that fits through the tube on these printers, so it is 1.75. There is three millimeter diameter um, filament. Don't buy it because you probably can't use it. Okay, so just stick to 175. Yeah. Flow percentage is the compensation amount of how much material is extruded during the object. So it's basically, if I increase this value by 10, it's going to squirt out 10% extra plastic. Um, this isn't a value I change very often and it's to change it. Um, usually your print should print fine with 100% flow. So, okay, so just stick to 100%. Yeah, 100%. I, I don't think I've ever really changed that value in it. I think I've changed other values to fix whatever was going on. All right, so next we have the nozzle size and that's actually hardware of your printer so you can't really change it unless you change the nozzle itself and it's 0.4. Okay. Excellent, so do you have any more questions about kind of? Um, no, not, not really. I mean, I think it, you kind of went through that um, in, in pretty good depth. I mean, other awesome. than what you went over is there something that you say well from my experience it's probably good to know this if this happens or some kind of troubleshooting i it's kind of like more when you come across something you start to realize it so that's kind of what i've really learned everything from just 
doing prints and trying to utilize my printer itself. And over time, you'll develop the same skills that you go, oh, I know how to fix that. And it may just be a simple cue setting, but it also might be something's wrong with your printer. So there's a whole bunch of troubleshooting steps and different kind of tips and tricks, and it's hard to narrow them all down into a nice area. So that's kind of why we use the support and we have the unlimited support. If you do come across something and you're like, well, I don't really know what to do, you can mm -hmm. contact us and usually we can give you tips or tricks on it, um, in most cases. So. Um, another thing you might want to keep in mind is print orientation. So this model isn't a great one to kind of demonstrate that with. But let me kind of talk to you about the interface of moving models around. So I went back to the normal view just by clicking view mode. With right click, we can rotate this area around. Right click, we can pan side to side. And then with the scroll wheel, we can move in and out. Okay. Next, we have a couple different options here. We have rotate, and it pops up three different axes that allow you to rotate the object as you please. And it's going to snap to 15 degrees. And then print, basically print orientation means like what is the best way that it's going to print. So this model doesn't really print good in any direction, so I can load a different one in. So these are just simple STL files that I've utilized before. Um, and I'll bring my shampoo lid in that I had. To. So I made this model in Fusion 360, and let's think about the print orientation in this fact. So another option we have, I'm going to scale this to two times the size. It's a shower, I thought. I actually was in the shower and said, I wonder if I can make that. And mm -hmm. I, and I, <laughs> um, question on that scaling option. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a multiplication, scale double, right? Yes, So the, exactly. So scale X, Y, Z is going to be a percentage. So one is going to be 100%, two would be 200%. So I increased it by 200 or uh, double the size. And you what about the um, underneath the size X, Y, Z? Now so that, that is imported from the STL. Um, have you ever come across times where you actually change that? Um, not normally, unless uh, you export from one of those, you know, CAD programs, and the file ends up being super small or super big. Sometimes they export as a different value, so they'll export as inches, and then when you put it in, it'll read it wrong, and it'll basically make it, you know, one by one point five by two millimeters instead of inches, right? And that's going to shrink your model super tiny, and then you'd have to increase the size. Yeah, so just scale it. By the exactly. Point. So if you were to change the size X and you knew how wide it was in that sense, you could just type in that value, and it'll immediately pop it to the size. So that's the only time that I've changed it. Okay. So you can also non-uniform scale it. So you can unclick this lock box, and then you could grab one of these boxes here, and I could scale it in any direction. I make it bigger or larger. So. You can also change the values here. So say 2.2. Now it's a little bit of a different size. So, or I can change this to just one. And you see the deformation that it caused. Mm -hmm. You can have non-uniform scales if you want. I'm just going to click the reset button and then increase it to two times so it's easier to see. Ooh, I guess we need proportionate. That's mad at me. So how does the the shampoo lid work? So the idea behind it was that I was going to utilize a living hinge. And well, now I can't get my value right. And the living hinge was going to operate just by itself and it wouldn't need anything else besides just being printed out. And in that sense, I need to orient it in a different way. So the best way to print this because of the living hinge idea would be on its side because it's obviously not going to print great this way and the best way to print it would be this direction. It's because it's going to give it perfect lines or basically the outer shell thickness here so it's going to do passes mm -hmm. which would create the most deformation allowance within this area. So based on the surface area of that hinge you printed it sideways knowing the, exactly. the way it goes and does its layers. Okay. Yes. So, you know, I could have printed it any other way, but that's just because I know how it's going to print that area, and I can actually check that in layer view. Here, all it does is two passes in that area that's going to deform, and this is the best way to print it. If I printed it laying flat, what it would do is make the lines going across that hinge, and when I would bend it, it would simply snap. So, 
Now, obviously, this printer's this isn't going to print well this way. We would need supports in it, and they would question hold on. Type. So since it's rounded on the on the end, you know, like because you printed it from the side. Um, uh -huh. was, was it coming out flat, or um, how did you get it to round? So this area. Yes. So yes, this area will turn out partially flat, but not by much. A good way to kind of avoid that is to use a brim. Um, to use a platform adhesion type, you could also use a raft and that would fix it as well. Um, it helps to make it to where it doesn't make it completely flat. Notice here that it will print this edge flat. You see how it's already that way? And if I look at the very first layer, it'll actually show me how flat that's going to be. So there's no real way to avoid it. It just ends up being like that. Okay, but still found your shampoo then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... This didn't quite work. It ended up breaking um, after about five to six times of movement, right? So obviously I would need to redesign my idea to make it again. So I would generate supports. And see, notice that now that I have supports in this area, I have a lot of surface area and it shouldn't knock it over. And then I would be capable of printing this. Okay. Do you have any more questions on Kira? No, for the most part, I think that answers just about everything, um, unless, I mean, from your experience, there's something that, you know, you've experienced a lot problem-wise, and there's like a secret, but other than that, no, it's... Honestly, um, no, I find that using the layer view is critical. If you don't use it, you'll often find that something gets messed up. Um, so I always check this view, and I always see how the printer's going to make it, so I like to scroll through it a little bit mm -hmm. and see what's going on inside of the model. And like, for instance, right well, inside here. Just the hinge and the way it's going to be deposited shows you on the layer view. So it's a good idea beforehand to check it out. Right. Um, okay. So if I change the shell thickness, you can watch the inside walls get larger. The walls will become much thicker. So if you notice here, there's an extra thickness to it. There's much more layers it'll go through to print them off. And then if I go back to that value, and then if I change the fill density, I change it to, let's say 50%, you'll notice that the yellow of the inside of the model should increase, and that'll make it much, much stronger on the inside of any area. Okay. okay. So whenever it does get these files, whenever you put STLs into Cura, it's just a shell, right? And then everything else is generated by Cura. So notice that there's much more yellow on the interior than before, which would make it much stronger. Awesome. So I think that's just about all I would like to cover. And then of course, all you'd have to do in order to export this is like file and save G code. So that's the second type. And then you put that into the printer, right? So you, I'm sure you guys have that process because you've already printed some things off with STLs. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I'm gonna go ahead and close Cura and we can come back. So that was kind of everything covering Cura and the initial use of it. Um, you can basically export that file and put it onto the SD card and then those go inside of the printer. So that was step two, Cura is step two. So you design STL, put it in Cura, and then three is going to be transfer it to the printer and four is gonna be print. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of kind of the idea of the training is just covering topics about the printer and how to utilize it and also tips and tricks on like leveling the build area and filament troubleshooting. So, um, do you, have you guys leveled the build plate on these already? How do you feel? We did and actually um, that was one of the first things we did about two weeks ago and I think what there's, there's three points uh, uh -huh. underneath the yeah. small one. Uh, um, on the smaller ones there's three points and so you're basically triangle which makes it a little bit difficult to think about whenever you are balancing it and you kind of have to tinker around with it mm -hmm. definitely get better with time you know the more and more i've done it i can basically eyeball the entire build plate now and adjust it really quickly and then have it printed um so as you get more and more used to it you will basically be able to use your eyeballs only and you won't even need the piece of paper so originally we say that you take a folded piece of paper and you place it on the build area and then level it for that small gap because the nozzle that you have right here that heats up and then the build plate should be 200 microns away. So that's basically two. Um, 
Um, and so that's a good distance for it to be that'll lay down a good layer. Generally, I, I like to, if I'm making a print for myself, I eyeball it and I start the print. And while it's starting to print, I'll actually adjust it till I see the right amount of material being extruded onto the build area. And I think it's really nice. And I go, I think that'll finish. Okay. So I always watch the very first layer go down to make sure that it's level in the area that I want it to be. And then I ensure that it is. If it's gone too far, I'll basically stop the print and restart the print. Okay. So that's just a couple tips on leveling. Do you want to go over leveling or do you guys feel comfortable with that? No, not so much. I think we, we kind of, uh, just as you mentioned, uh, the very first time we did, we did notice, um, you know, it's, tilted in a certain way and not much filament was deposited on one side yes so I think we can cover that but i think that's also a good point that you mentioned we can and in real time adjust the build plate um and then also just canceling and restarting saving filament too so yeah i that's my favorite way um i usually just heat the printer up start printing, and then when it's going through that layer i'll watch it i can kind of already pre-level it just by adjusting it with before it's printing when I auto home it and check the distance between every point and then start to print then when it starts printing finally once it's heated up and everything then I'll watch it and if there's any area that seems like too circular so if it's too circular there's not enough surface area on the build plate then mm. I guess it's not adhering well because it's basically has a tangent right and tangent is the build plate but it's not gonna stick very well. So you actually want it to be much flatter and kind of more like a small rectangular shape. Because the nozzle will press into the plastic and then the build plate's gonna be pressing against it. So it goes into that kind of you know, flatter surface. And that's really what you wanna look like. Um, I have a quick question, actually two of them. Um, it mentions masking tape versus the blue. Uh -huh. what, what would you prefer and also, um, Last time, I, I, it was pretty hard pulling it off. Is there any tips that you would, yeah, pull it, pulling off your finished 3D printed uh, model? So, do you guys have this with the, pl or the, the fiberglass underneath? Uh, yeah, we do. So, if you flex these, it makes it much easier to pull the build off of it. So, you can flex it in this direction and then flex it back and it break the surface area underneath it so that the print comes off of it easier. So, I you twist it here at two angles and then do the other two. And then, I, um, so the typical painter's tape is going to be much more difficult. If you already have these blue build surfaces, we recommend only printing on these. And these are actually microscopic surfaces, so they do trap oils. So if you touch it a whole bunch with your hands like I'm doing right now, I need to wipe it off and make it clean so that it stick better. And then also the plastic will lay into it better just because of those microscopic pores. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind when using these. If you want to clean the surface to make something stick better or you're having issues sticking, acetone is an excellent thing to use. Acetone. Acetone. Mm -hmm. Either that or you, you can use 91% alcohol, but acetone is preferable. Okay. And then just take a piece of paper towel or something, pour the acetone on the towel, and then wipe it, and then it's good. So. That's a way to adhere better. And then if you're trying to get prints off better, then I recommend flexing it and then twisting or kind of edging it to the side. So. I don't think so. What's up? Oh, nothing. I was speaking to someone. You're good. Okay, so what other information you kind of want? I love answering these questions. These are great. Um. Wait, what, what What? was the second one I mentioned? Oh, yeah. Um, so you would recommend the blue over? Yes. Yes, definitely. If you have these things that are called lock builds, use the lock builds. Um, hold on. I have a question real quick. Go ahead. Is there any recycling company that would sell it? Yeah, if there was any recycling companies that would sell the actual filament, um, is it like a specialized plastic or is this something that? So at this point in time, I don't think there's anything that there is, there isn't a recycling company you can like give your stuff back to. And there's not necessarily a place that will actually sell recycled plastic back to you. Uh, I haven't come across either of those. So you would kind of have to do your own research. So we are looking ourselves, we're looking to buy a machine that will actually remelt the plastic so we can repurpose it. The only issue with repurposing this PLA plastic is that it actually basically degrades the plastic 
and it causes it to be a little bit more lumpy, and then it's only going to be like basically makes a whole bunch of colors. Okay. Um, so we haven't we haven't exactly found a good uh, recycling area for PLA. Do they sell these for the big one? Um, I, do, they sell the the blue bases for the big A thirty one. Yeah. Yes, we do. They're right around thirty five dollars in their twelve by twelve or half by twelve. Um, you can find those on our website. Okay. .com, yeah. And then if you need a new one of the smaller ones, the smaller ones are right around 15, I believe. But usually these last for a while. Um, these can typically last up to a year if they're kind of taken care of. Otherwise, it's kind of like six months and then you beat them out. Um, I know that ours are really beaten up, but we still use them all because they still work for just fine. So mm -hmm. I can say that you, you might have little pot marks in it from the nozzle burning into the build area. And it may cause like kind of a puddle area. So your prints will actually have a bubble on the bottom of it from then on, but it's not going to hurt it in any way. It just adjusts the finishing touch of your model. And you could always see it. What else? Well, um, anybody have any other questions over here? Awesome. So do you, have you encountered any filament issues or problems? No. And um, I was going to mention that like starting up, what are the steps involved in getting the filament correctly into the depositing, um, you know, mechanism? Okay, perfect. So I can kind of cover base on that. So I'm going to plug my printer in real quick and go over. So here, which firmware do you have? Do you have this same exact firmware as this? Say NWA 3D here. Um, all I know is it says, it says Mendel ready. So does it have a similar screen to this once booted? Um, I'm not too sure. Right now it says Mendel ready. That, that's all I'm looking at on this end. Mendel ready. Yeah, it, it has like XYZ, zero. It's like at the, um, the origin, you can say. Okay. All right, so if we click on the button once, what do you see next? What are the words that pop up? Info screen, prepare, control, no SD card, initial. Prepare, okay, yeah. So you're working with the older firmware, so this one might look a little bit different, but bear with me as we go through it. So we click on setup, then we have the preheat PLA, and then we also have the preheat ABS. Is that true? Okay, um, yeah, let me go under prepare. Uh, disable steppers, preheat PLA, preheat ABS. Yeah, so the ABS is going to heat it to 200 something, I believe, and then the preheat PLA should heat it to 190. Okay. The thing that we have changed preheat PLA or ABS to on that printer is 100 degrees Celsius. So we've actually changed it to something called a soft pool. Soft pools are used whenever you're removing filament or you're changing filament or you're trying to remove clogs from your printer. So those are three different things that you can utilize it for. It heats it up to 100 degrees Celsius. It heats this chamber up. So if you already have plastic running through this area and stuck inside of your nozzle, because if you let it dry inside of there, of course you can't just pull it out. So you have to heat it up to get it out. Heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius, which is the transition phase of this plastic from a liquid to a solid, and then pull it out. It's going to pull out a lot more material and also remove a lot more plastic with it so it cleans out your nozzle quicker. Mm -hmm. And if you're removing plastic, use a soft pool or basically preheat it. And whenever you see it reach 100, grab it and pull it out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, for loading filament, we recommend heating it to 190 degrees is fine, which is going to be your preheat PLA set. PLA like I just did. Once it reaches 190, 200 degrees and push the filament through this area, so it's super easy in that sense. Once you have the spools, we like to keep the spools for safety and spooling. We like to keep it through one of these holes here so that it doesn't unspiral. If it does unspiral, it leaves the possibility for your filament to become tangled and then it can basically create a knot in this spool and then it's not gonna feed in. So that's something you wanna avoid. If you have kind of frills like that, of course you need to cut them. So my end, Little bit kind of weird and pointed and it's not going to work. I like to cut it at a almost like a 
70 degree angle to make it sharp. That way it comes to a point and it makes it easier to feed into the printer. Back here, and then all we do is we squeeze, squeeze the trigger in the back and then push it through both areas and all the way through the tube. And then we recommend that once you get it all the way through the tube, a little bit extra, you push out any old filament or old colors that you may have any, had in the printer. And then if I take a look at the nozzle, you'll notice that plastic kind of oozing out of it. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's how you clear colors the best way, is just going to extra through the back. And that's just by squeezing the trigger and it's just going to push it through the tube and push out pressure of the plastic. So, and whenever you do that, that's at uh, 190 Celsius, correct? Yes, 190. You can also heat it up to 220. We find that it flows the best uh, at 220 degrees Celsius. Wanted to increase that value on your printer, if you click on the button and you go down to controls, and then you select nozzle, you can actually individually change the temperature of the nozzle. So I could change it to uh, 245 is the highest you can go, and then I could change it to, say, 205 if I wanted to, and let it cool off till there. So, in controls, you can decide the nozzle temperature, and you can heat it to 220 while it's sitting still and not printing. So, that's kind of what we recommend for that. If you are using the older firmware, I might recommend using controls to heat your nozzle, so you can click on the button, and just go controls and then change the nozzle temperature. I think old firmware might have a different thing. So it might go controls, then temperature, then nozzle. Mm -hmm. And if you want to explore your printer, you can always look for that. Yeah, no, we, yeah, we can do that on, on our own time. Yeah, that's what I figured. So awesome. What else do you think about uh, loading and unloading filament? Um, so let's say we want to have the idea of like we're done printing and we want to basically uh, shut it down correctly for the next use. You, uh, it would be ideal to pull out the filament, right? Rather than avoiding it next time in the meeting. What would be like the, the process in basically shutting it down? Um, so if it basically finished its print and do you want the scenario that it's still heated or that it's cold? Um, well, there would be... Yeah, like it's just heated kind of it's thing. It's still heated? Well, my recommended idea is unplug the printer, pull the filament out, pull the filament out. Hmm. That, that makes it super easy, super quick. The only thing that this is going to cause is that you're probably going to have a little bit extra spray plastic inside this area. So whenever you put in the new color of filament, you'll just have to squeeze a little bit more. Okay. In you're doing it from cold, so say it finished its print and moved off here to the side, and the print's sitting here, right? It's basically waiting for you to do anything, so it already cooled off the nozzle and it's cold. Choosing preheat, whenever it reaches 100 degrees, then pull out the filament, and then you can unplug the printer again, and then it'll be good and set. Okay. So that's pretty much the two scenarios that you could come across in that, in that idea. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, super easy. I like to do this whenever I finish like a training or something. I just simply pull it out real quick. Anything else? I think for the most part, you answered just about all of the, the concerns. We had questions. Um, awesome. The initial setup to the shutdown process and also the software involved. Yeah, um, well, guys, I feel like it's been good. I feel like you guys should be really good at 3D printing. You have well, excellent questions. So in, in comparison, I've had some people that don't know what questions to ask or otherwise. And, you know, it's just they need to learn a little bit more about the technology. But you guys asked, like, a lot of questions that were more in-depth than other people. And um, I think you'll do excellent at 3D printing. I think you... You guys are well on your way to coming. Mm -hmm. Well, we appreciate your time. And um, if we do have any questions in the future, or if I do run across something, I'll just go ahead and email you.
and I'm sure yeah, something. Yeah, so we actually do have a support ticket. So if you do have anything that goes wrong with your printers, or you just kind of like want some general tips and tricks, um, if you message into our support ticket, myself included is part of the service team. Um, so we will be responding to any questions that you may have or issues that you may have with your printer. And just if you go to our website, click on the support tab, and then just the support ticket form, and then you can fill it out. Um, if you have kind of an education related question, you are more than welcome to email me directly. Okay. Awesome. Thank well, you. It's been good, guys. Yeah, of course. I had a great time kind of going over everything with you. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now.